everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk, where you get great news, interviews, interviewees, sometimes a comedic touch. Just talking to my friend here, I just reached back into my catalog of um, interviewees that I'd interviewed, but I only had in print. And I thought I'd bring him on to uh, so you can see what he's doing and uh, what he's up to these days. Today, I've got Yuli John Roth. How are you doing, Yuli? Doing very well. Thank you. That's awesome. So, I'd spoken to you a few years ago in 2019, and you were on an American and Canadian tour. Um, describe briefly um, the reception you got. I remember one thing clear, well, two things, but one thing super clearly was that your set was about two hours long. That's wrong. It was okay. three hours. Sorry? <laughs> three hours. It was, it was actually three hours, yeah. Oh. Um, but, um, yeah, well, um, but there was an, an intermission um, you know, and um, at least on most evenings. And it was basically um, the story of my life. You know, I was going back like uh, it was my 50th anniversary kind of tour. Right. So I played a lot of stuff, including some stuff from when I first started out, you know, we even played um, Apache from the uh, Shadows. And um, yeah. So it was a long show, but I have to say we didn't get any complaints, you know, um, and uh, and sometimes that's okay, you know. Yeah. To, to I can complain. only imagine you wouldn't get any complaints. Um, um, well, first... you might. Hang on, let me just take this off. So, um, <clears throat> but um, no, I mean that's the worst that could happen, you know, if you overplay and then people start getting bored. Um, that would not be a good thing. I always try to keep my programs very varied, you know, and uh, make it interesting. Also, there's um, a good deal of improvisation. So every night is, yeah, it's always kind of different, you know. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's important to, and helps to keep it fresh. I'm not one of these people who, um, uh, yeah, rehearse everything to the umpteenth degree and then have it like split perfect every night exactly the same. There are some bands that do that, you know, they are like awkward, but uh, to me, it's, um, you know, I would just really, really get bored. <laughs> I get For bored with repetition, full stop. For sure. So you started out in Don Road and then everybody knows um, you, uh, you did five albums with the Scorpions. Uh, it was the first five. I know the first four but I know there's a fifth in there. What was your favorite album to record with Klaus and the gang? Um, it's not an easy question to answer because I think my perspective had changed a little bit over the years. Back then and for many years, it was definitely the the, the third one, which was Virgin Killer. Yeah. Know? The one where we were like in full flow of, of really, we, I think we, we had found our ground and we, where um, our songwriting had progressed in quality, and we're pushing the the envelope really, you know, as a band, and uh, it was like a no holds barred thing, and we were also doing an awful lot of touring, and um, they were good tours. We, we, I mean, you could really feel the sense of progress in the band, you know, musically. It was um, getting better all the time, and. Um, I think the album like reflects that, you know. Right, right. Well, my favorite song. So just listening to actually, um, um, not sales of Sharon, but uh, in any event, I was just watching one of the videos with you guys, and I saw Klaus, and he was he was almost dancing like Jagger. It was it was pretty. <laughs> yeah, uh, he did that a lot. You know. We'll burn the sky. That was the video. We'll burn right. the sky. That 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 is, uh, I think, one of the best tracks. Um. And but that was on the Taken by Force album, you yeah. know, and then afterwards on Tokyo Tapes. And it's one of the songs that I still have in my repertoire. Awesome. Know? Awesome. Because it's it's just a, a really, really strong live song and people relate to it because it's got um, great melodies throughout. Yeah. yeah. Okay, before we get into all the great stuff you've got coming up, um, when we did speak before, because I found out you were in Wales, actually, you're still in, uh, is it pronounced Powsey? Powys? Powys. Powys. I am in Powys, yeah. I've got this up here because the... Uh, much the middle Board of nowhere. You know? I've got this up here because the Welsh Board of Tourism asked me to promote you guys. <laughs> Not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. 
Speaking of comedy, we did talk about something that I thought was unique because when I talked to you the first time, I'm a big Benny Hill fan, always have been. And we talked about that because, uh, you know, Welsh is, uh, you know, United Kingdom. Um, who who did you tell me back then was your favorite? Um, I think I remember now. Peter Sellers was your favorite, one of your favorite comedians. No, my my favorite. Uh, that's uh, very easy to answer. It's actually John Cleese. Oh, right, right. Okay. Yeah, I, I love the um, the Faulty Tower stuff, you know. And, I mean, living in the UK, um, it's... It's a land of comedy, or it used to be. You know, the great ones, some of them are still alive. I mean, uh, Cleese is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for some reason, I don't, you know, there used to be all these great uh, comedies on television when we still had like normal uh, yeah. channels. Um, but nowadays, uh, everything has gone down the tubes. I think, you know, it's it's all become too woke. And the woke thing is not good for comedy. It really isn't, you know, because comedians, um, particularly people like John Cleese, they thrive on, yeah, also antagonizing people a little bit, you know, and and, and having some dark humor. Right. And, uh, you know, nowadays, I feel people in uh, maybe in the media or wherever it is, I don't know so many people like that personally, but they seem to be very thin skinned. So yes. it's like uh, extremely um, cautious uh, not to say the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. Right. You know, I'm completely ridiculous. I Unnatural find. is the way I If you know what, what I mean, you know. But England and Wales or, or the UK used to be the center of comedy. They had the great comedies. It started with Charlie Chaplin in the olden right. days. So then you had Laurel and Hardy. Um, uh, I mean, Sam Laurel, he was British, of course. And he came from the same stable as Chaplin. Uh, Carno, Fred Carno. We used to tour the vaudeville theaters in the States. That's how they um, became good, these guys, um, you know, and uh, England then has produced some of the greatest uh, comedians and great sitcoms, you know. I don't know much of that has made it to Canada. I mean, 40 Towers probably has, but there were other sitcoms, things like political comedies, you know, um and uh like about Westminster and the corridors of power right. you know uh yeah and and uh, I used to watch these in the 80s and I still sometimes do when I um when I wind down and, and there's also great American comedies um not just the um staple diet of cheers from the 80s or whatever yeah. that a lot of great actors there, you know, with all these these uh, characters that they had with Ted Danson and Kirstie Alley. Yes, she uh, didn't. She just pass away. Yes, she did. I wow. I, I, she, I go uh, into a. I have a local enjoy. coffee shop. I went into her to that place yesterday, and no kidding, guy goes Norm, but it wasn't a bar. It's a coffee shop. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, the... Norm, exactly. <laughs> you know. But uh, America had uh, some great uh, comedies, you know. Right. Uh, so, even towards this stuff like uh, Veep, which was, um, I, I really liked that one, you know. Mm -hmm. And had things like Tina Fey, 30 Rock. I thought that was phenomenal. Yeah. Anyway, so, I like comedy to wind down. And sometimes, you know, on the tour bus, we, we have some of these running. <laughs> You you have to you have to be light because touring is probably I've never done it myself, but I've traveled so it's similar so it it can be exhausting mentally and physically so yeah you need a bit of Every, uh, everything yes it is exhausting is a good word it's quite a test of of mental you know you have to really um yeah know what you're doing when you're on a long tour like that right. particularly. With in our case, you know, performing like three hours, I had um, 
um, more than that, because before that, we did a pre-show, a VIP pre-show, where I performed the entire Vivaldi's show season, so that puts it to four hours performance in the day. Then we did an after show, etc., interviews, like with guys like yourself, on the bus. Um, very often, it's a question of, um, you know, how much sleep can I get? Right. And I'm like, uh, then after the show, sometimes you, you play these clubs in the, in, in the States, and uh, some shows run very, very late. You know, there are places, like if you play like the Whiskey or Go-Go in Los Angeles, which is an iconic place, but uh, they start off with uh, quite a few support acts. Then you start, I don't know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night right. to your show. Yeah. Um, then afterwards, you have to kind of wind down on the tour bus because you've got like a surplus of adrenaline. Then the tour, the bus leaves while you're trying to sleep, you know, and uh, next morning you wake up in San Francisco or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite a um, yeah traveling circus. But I have to say, we we all like my my entire band without. Fail everybody um, here from Europe. We all love touring of America, including Canada, of course. Right. So Canada at this time of the year is a definite no. A little, a little chilly for sure. I did a couple of times. No, actually more than a couple of times, and we got stuck with the bus in Montreal, snowed in. We didn't even make it to the show. I remember one time. So uh, it's pretty gruesome. With the, mm -hmm. with the thumbnail, um, I'd already said uh, interview, riffs, and something else with Uli, I have to check. But unfortunately, um, you weren't prepared for riffs, so I mean, I apologize <laughs> for uh, misleading people, but I'm not changing my thumbnail. Anyways, what's going on with you now? I know three big things are coming up. I know that you're doing the 70,000 tons of metal in 2023. You must be looking forward to that. Good, warm, hot weather. Yeah, we're doing that in January, and um, it's for me. It'll be the third time, third time on this boat. I've done a, a lot of metal cruises in Europe and uh, you know Scandinavia, Mediterranean, uh, but the seventy thousand tons was actually the the very first one we were right. on. I remember that was in two thousand eleven. Mm -hmm. I guess the maiden voyage of of that entire concept and. Um, I remember that everybody loved it. We it, it was really a very special uh, moment and playing on the pool deck in the Caribbean, you know, with the sun coming down and the whole pool deck, the, the, the audience became one with the, the band, you know, while we were playing. Yeah. We had Chuck Billy come on uh, to do um, the vocal of um, Sales of Sharon, which he hadn't done in a long time. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was it was a special moment. I I don't forget that. So this time we're going to um, the island of Bimini, which is a part of the Bahamas. Right, right. Yeah. In a, yeah. in addition to that, end of January, January, mm -hmm. right. Um, in addition to that, um, before we get to um, something you're writing, um, yeah, tell everybody about the Alpha experience. Yeah, um, that's another thing uh, which is on the horizon for next year. And, and for me, that's a, a very important um, project because it's going to involve um, a big orchestra, a symphony orchestra, <clears throat> the Symphony Orchestra of Cologne, the city of Cologne in, in Germany. And uh, we're going to do several shows. And the first one is actually in June in um, a town called Essen in Germany. We are going to, we're also working on having other um, shows with that, uh, including the uh, Vienna, um, uh, I think the, the, the Vienna um, Opera. Right. And uh, the music is, is basically uh, uh, symphonic with a lot of rock, you know, so yeah, I've written over the years, I've written a lot of that kind of music. Uh, very few of it has been published as yet, but uh, that's going to change because we're going to record that live as well. Perfect. So, so it, basically, uh, you, you have to 
envision like a multimedia show. We've got a big screen at the back with the music, uh, the there there are storylines on the screen following the music or the other way around. Uh, um, and uh, then on stage you have um some rock singers mm -hmm. with opera singers plus full band and the full orchestra. Mm. So that's alpha experience. It kind of sounds like the concept is um similar to a Roger Waters tour. Uh, I'm not aware of what he does now. Well, he's but... in the screen behind him. He's got videos. Oh, yeah, okay. But you see, for me, this is not actually a new thing because back uh, exactly uh, 30 years ago now, in 1993, because this will be next year, uh, 23. In 1993, we did um, my first ever big uh, symphony hall concert with orchestra and the screen. And that was called Symphonic Rock for Europe. Um, but uh, I haven't done many of these since. And now uh, at the back of my mind, I was always kind of envisioning to get back into that because it allows me to um, present a completely different um, set of music songs, you know, which, which I cannot play with like in a, in a normal rock environment. Right. So, yeah, to me, that's very exciting. So it sounds like since you started that 30 years ago, not only do you um, allow good interviewers to interview you, just kidding, you're an innovator. Um, well, I'm certainly somebody who was uh, from, from when I started playing, you know, I've always kind of, I was always interested in exploring the unknown, if that right. makes sense. You know, I think I'm a bit of an explorer. I, I like to go where I haven't gone before. And sometimes, um, occasionally, that's also where no one else has gone before. You know, in that sense, yes, I, I would actually probably call myself an um, And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't like to do the same thing over and over again. That's, that's... But talking about touring, um, we are going to come to your neck of the woods because um, an American tour, including Canada, is in the making for September. Wow. And to my agent, and he said, it's looking good. We'll probably have something like 20 shows. And um, it will be uh, probably another two and a half hour or three hour show. I'm, I'm afraid. Yes, sorry. Wow. Uh, but uh, there's, it's going to be uh, quite a mixed bag because I'm starting off the show um, in a sense, it's almost like in an evening with Uli John Roth kind of thing, you know? So I'm starting off with a TED talk for about half an hour about my new book. Because yes, in, that's, what I want, that's what I wanted to bring up. You're currently, um, how far along in the process is the book, uh, Uli? The book, is, the book is, is finished. I got it right here. Looks like this. Whoa. And, uh, yes, it's a big piece. That's upside down. Looks like a big, heavy photo album. It is. Um, I mean, it, it's absolutely massive. It's My got goodness. Um, 800, uh, no. It's got about 650 pages, you know. Wow. A thousand photographs. And uh, I've designed it myself because I wanted it to be a bit of an artistic statement. Mm -hmm. What's called, the title of it? It's called In Search of the Alpha Law, which is, um, the book is uh, not about sex, drugs, and Rock and roll. <laughs> right. It's a book um, with a philosophical kind of uh, content, uh, but it's not just that. It's um, it's a lot about metaphysics of life, of music, mm -hmm. and how um, those two things uh, can be very much the same, you know. Very early on, uh, I started to get interested in uh, the metaphysics of music, which is 
uh, a difficult thing to explain, but it's it's basically uh, the fact that everything in life or in in the universe has a frequency, right. and music affects that. And music is like the almost like the blueprint uh, because there are, there are certain musical laws which a musician knows and people know them subconsciously like if you play a wrong chord everybody knows that's a wrong chord you know mm -hmm. uh, um it's that's it's that simple most people have that that kind of understanding without really knowing what it is now a musician would know how to tune the instrument so that that chord is not the wrong chord anymore mm -hmm. because it's the right chord. But um, metaphysics of music is all about that which is behind the uh, scenes in music. You know, I, I was fascinated by the question: is why is a certain note um, different from another note? Why does one feel like this? Why doesn't A feel like this and the G feels like this? D minor? As, as, well, yeah. Why does uh, a certain chord do this and a certain rhythm do that? Right. Uh, primitively speaking. And you can take that very, very far, you know? And and I did because um, I started, once I started to see that these things are all interrelated, I started to see the uh, world with through the eyes of music. Like, um, is there a harmony or is there a disharmony? And all the shades right. in between, you know? And what this book is kind of all about, uh, it starts from, from that um, found, foundation, you know, seeing the world through the eyes of music, but then it goes into other things like uh, talks about um, you know our mind how our mind works and how it interprets things uh mind spirit body you know uh it's it's a book about um it's about basically the evolution of our own kind of mind how can we how can we get to the next plateau and, and, and grow, you know, and, and become better with whatever we do, you know, whether we want to be a better person or a better guitar player. Um, music can actually teach you a lot. And uh, it, once you know that, you know, and I mean, let, I don't mean the musical keys, but once you know uh, what to look for and how. Right. You know, are you and familiar that's with what, what that is, you know? Are you familiar with the Dr. Leonard Horowitz? Um, no. Why? He he is very big. When you brought that up, I was blown away because I wasn't anticipating this. I uh, I read a lot of his stuff and he talks about the vibrations and frequencies and everything, especially 528 hertz. And he talks about Originally, there was six notes in the scale, but they found a seventh note, and they call it the devil's note. <laughs> you aware of what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, the, this is um, basically you're talking about the triton. Yeah, you know, um, the the triton, the uh, the um, Western spectrum of music can be divided into twelve steps. Right. Well. You can also divide it into 24 or or 6, but 12 is the magic number here for right. a lot of reasons, which I won't get into. Mm -hmm. Now, the 12, um, these 12 are like a rainbow spectrum, yeah. you know? Um, and, uh, well, I mean, I do have a guitar here, but it's not plugged in. So i just show you quickly what I mean. Um, oh, we're getting our riffs. Awesome. Yeah, we're not getting a riff. It's not even plugged in because I wasn't prepared for this kind of thing. But, okay, this is doing the semitone down now. If you have your A440 here, you know, so to me, that's always like a color red note. Right. Then um, you, you kind of 
That was 12 notes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, uh, sorry, that's 13 because it's the new octave. Right. So um, it starts basically on this um, being like the color red. Then um, the next one would be orange. It goes through the spectrum, you know. And um, first you have the, the red colors, uh, the warm spectrum is the first half of the octave. Then it goes into the blue, um, the green in the middle, and then the um, octave again, red, except for this red, this is much brighter and much lighter. Each mm -hmm. octave, that's an octave, means the energy is like doubled and it gets twice as bright. If you go dark, it becomes darker and darker at the at the very end of the spectrum. You can barely see it becomes almost black. It's sort of like in a dark room, you know, and then with each octave, you have twice the light. Now the triton is this, you know? Mm. And it is the seventh note. It's one, two, three, and five, six, seven. It's the seven of the twelve. And there's a, I mean, I've got a whole chapter about this because there's a lot of significance to this. But um, yeah, that's what that means, you know. And the, basically, the reason why it was called the devil in musica, a diabolus in musica. Uh, and the, they they named this note or this uh, kind of um, this kind of uh, interval. Right. They named that in medieval times already. You know because it is extremely unstable. Um, it's basically almost antagonizing because if I have like of all the notes, you know, you have some that will create a nice harmony, like, yeah, that's okay. like a nice major chord on this. That's nice. That's nice. That's nice. That's your blues chord, but still okay. But you have some which are like, which are pretty, pretty unbearable. Yes. Yeah. And that's because uh, the root note in everything is basically the the one note where all the energy um gathers and it's it's like the root note is like the sun um you know and all the other notes are like planets going around the sun right. and all about the distance from here to there how far is it because each time you move from the root note, the distance um, uh, increases, and this note is the one that has all the gravity, because all the other notes are basically drawn towards it. Like if I have this, Daddy, where does it want to go? It wants to go back. And if I have, da, where does it want to go up? It wants to always go to this one note. Right. Which is a major chord now in this case. Yeah. The reason why I'm going for those people who watch it, this isn't a major chord because my guitar is doing the semitone down. Mm -hmm. Now, normally this is what it would look like, but that looks like wow. now a flat major. Anyways, so it's all about these relationships. And it so happens that the triton is the one note which is exactly furthest away from the root note. It's halfway between the octave, the seven, because this is the root, this is the root, you have these two, and this is in between. So it's kind of almost diametrically opposed. And um, what it asks for is um, a resolution. And you can do, for instance, you could do this. You know, if you move a semitone up, immediately you've got a harmony, which is nice. Or you could do this, just a right. semitone 
down and you have a harmony, you know. But this note, like, these are stacked tridents, you know, and they ask for, they ask for resolution or to a major chord. Wow. Um, what's this, at the end of your guitar at, uh, on the uh, the headstock there, Uli? Uh, were you at a show recently? Did somebody throw something up on stage? You mean this? <laughs> yeah. I, I've always had feathers ever since the scorpions. Don't ask me why. I just, like, I guess. Um, I love it. It helps the guitar to fly. So when is the book going to be released in North America, or is it? Or um, it... We are, we are, we're shooting uh, for having it released before the tour. Um, okay. uh, and, yeah, that's under progress now. Okay. That is awesome news. Well, you know what? You actually helped me out here, so I'm just going to change riffs to Guitar Theory. <laughs> Um, before I let you go, my friend, I just want to ask you one more question. I'll I was just playing. Are you talking? <laughs> I'll um, put the links and everything to um, your website and the tour information in the description box below. But what is the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. Thanks. Do as Uli John Roth says, legendary guitarist, and subscribe to the channel so you get great interviews like this. And once again, my friend, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.